Zion National Park receives around 4 to 5 million visitors each year with no sign of slowing down. And with good reason. This park is beautiful. But with high visitation comes a lot of rules and restrictions in order for the National Park Service to protect and preserve this land. Here are some of the things you need to know before you come visit Zion and some of the sites you will get a chance to see in the park. There are two main entrances into the park. The south entrance coming from the town of Springdale. So this is the town of Springdale, which is on the west side of Zion and it's pretty, pretty, uh, you know, pretty touristy. Is the more popular entrance into the park. As Springdale has a lot to offer in ways of accommodation, renting gear, food, and entertainment. So expect to wait in a line for the entrance into the park if you're coming from Springdale. As soon as you enter the park from this entrance, you are right at the visitor center where you can catch the shuttle. Guys, this is my first national park um, line ever. I've never had to deal with a line before. <laughs> the other entrance into the park is the east entrance, which in my opinion is worth the extra few miles because the views are absolutely incredible. The funny part of Zion is it's the most lackluster drive. Driving into, na <laughs> into this national park is just brown grass, dead trees and everything. And then all of a sudden you hit Zion and it's like, Oh. Yeah, the whole ride in is like this. <laughs> and then boom! This entrance also takes you through the historical Mount Carmel Tunnel. If you have a larger vehicle or an RV, they do charge a fee to pass through the tunnel because they have to make it a one way. You can find the exact dimensions of the tunnel on the National Park website. But if you're in a tiny car like me, this is the best way to see the park. This is coming in from the east entrance, by the way, so if you're coming from Springdale, you're going to miss this part of the drive, but definitely worth the drive through. Now, you are not allowed to actually drive in Zion National Park due to the high volume of visitors the park receives each year. This means you have to go to the visitor center to park and catch a shuttle in. When the visitor center lot fills up, there are parking options in the town of Springdale with shuttles running into the town as well. In different times in the winter, there are no shuttles and you are free to drive through the park yourself. Definitely make sure to come early. This lot fills up quick because nobody's allowed in the park. I found a spot. Even though they said the parking lot was full. <laughs> Just sitting here waiting for the shuttle by myself. Depending on the time of year you go, the first shuttle starts at different times. So if you want to start a hike early, your best option is to book a room at the Zion Lodge. This allows you entrance into the restricted part of the park because that's where the lodge is located. I did this on my first time I stayed at Zion and it was well worth the money to experience Zion so quiet without all the shuttles passing through in the very early morning. You should book in advance though because the lodge does book up pretty quickly, especially in the summer season. One of the first stops in the park is the Court of the Patriarch, where you get a chance to see three towering peaks from up on a short trail above the tree line. So that is Abraham, that is Isaac, and that is Jacob, the white peaks there. Named after the biblical figures in the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Very cool. This is also where I learned how runoff water down the canyon walls leaves tracks and stains. And you will see a lot of them as you explore the park. Next, I decided to explore the Emerald Pools trails. There's a lower Emerald Pool that later connects to an upper Emerald Pool trail. On this trail, you get a chance to see where runoff water from the canyon cliffs has collected. And you could even walk under the dripping water from above. Gotta love all the people. <laughs> it is the middle of the day on a beautiful day, so don't blame everyone for being out here. The upper pool is slightly more strenuous as it requires a little bit of scrambling, but at the end you are met with a pool with a gorgeous sandstone backdrop. Also, one million people will be there to enjoy the sights with you, so prepare for that. Or come way earlier than I did. 
It's a very pretty trail though, and shaded by the trees and the canyons, definitely making it worth a stop on your visit to enjoy the river and the pools. If you want to escape the crowds for a little bit, taking a stroll on the sand bench trail is a great way to do that. This flat trail goes on for miles, but I just took a quick walk to have a break from people for a little bit and to enjoy the valley floor and the little critters that were running around. Something I learned after I got into the park was that the canyon walls were actually constantly crumbling as the canyon was growing. Rock slides were responsible for the closure of some of the sites, and you could see huge boulders littering the sides of the roads and the valley floor. I'm not saying this to try to scare you, but just for you to be aware. If you hear something, be alert and conscious of this. Next up, the Narrows. This is one of the more popular attractions in the park. It is a chance to walk through and sometimes swim through a river. This hike does not require a permit, but to safely do it, you need to rent a lot of gear. For anyone who has watched any of my videos, you know I'm way too clumsy to be walking all over slippery rocks. So I decided to stick to dry land and do the riverside walk, which is the walk you need to take in order to get to where the Narrows actually begins. Before you attempt to hike the Narrows, make sure to have waterproof shoes, pants, poles, and check the weather. Flash floods have resulted in injury and death for visitors who set out on this hike on rainy days. So make sure to only do this hike when the weather permits it. It was late afternoon at this point, and the setting sun was causing the canyons to glow. They really did look that pink in person. And then I ran into an old enemy. I'm just gonna walk carefully around the stay. I'm sorry, bud. snakes and nudity. I can't seem to escape it on this trip. <laughs> and now the moment you have all been waiting for. Angel's Landing. Angel's Landing is a narrow trail 1400 feet above the canyon floor. I forgot how tall Angel's Landing is. Um, this thing is massive. <laughs> it is known for its chain to hold on to as you navigate a small trail on the edge of a cliff. And now we climb. <laughs> this trail has resulted in injury and death to some of the park visitors. So make sure you prepare for this hike with the right equipment and the right state of mind. The layers are coming off. <sighs> for anyone who hasn't heard yet, starting in 2022, the Park Service requires a permit to hike this dangerous angel's landing. You could enter into a lottery in advance, or you could take your chances and do the day before lottery. There is a fee to enter this lottery as well. There are different time slots for beginning the hike that the permit is good for, and there was a park ranger sitting at the trailhead asking to see permit information. All right, I just filled out a day before lottery for Angel's Landing, so we'll see if I get it for tomorrow. That would be fun. So I had applied for an Angel's Landing permit for tomorrow, and I was rejected. So I won't play the real lottery either, because I'll probably lose. Not today, Angel's Landing. Everything happens for a reason, though, so. If you don't win the lottery, I would still say the hike up to Angel's Landing is rewarding and challenging enough. And there is a secret gem if you continue on past Angel's Landing Trailhead. If you continue up the West Rim Trail, you are met with views of the other side of the canyon. There was no one there the two hours I spent up there. And the views were incredible, almost as good as Angel's Landing. Just this trail is less dangerous and way more peaceful. So don't be too upset if you don't win the lottery, because look at this. Before you visit any park, you really need to check the National Park Service website for updates. Trails and roads will close for a variety of reasons, and to have a smooth park experience, it's always good to know in advance what will be available to you when you visit. Happy and safe travels, everyone! Alright, I know I said this about literally every spot, but I don't think I'm going to leave here. 
Have you ever been in a situation where you were completely and utterly powerless?